the, inten the intention of this uh, lesson is not to make anyone mad. It's to inform you and to make you think. Because we haven't, as a nation, we haven't been thinking for a long time. And pray that I don't go anywhere but here because this is the most important manuscript in the world, the King James 1611 Bible. We're going to be looking at the Laodicea Church to where we are right now, to the rapture. And pray for me, I've had a lot of sinus problems with this allergies and stuff, but when God showed me this, it's like every time he shows me, I go, oh, woe is us. You know, why are we so dumb? In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7, it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh his, even his enemies at peace with him. When's the last time we've had peace? This is called, this name of this lesson is called an observation from heaven. So how do we please the Lord? In Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 it says, This I say, then walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lust, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. So that Ye cannot do the things that ye would, but if ye be led by the Spirit, ye are not under the law. America is, has experienced for the last 200 and so many years a great delusion and apostasy that has happened to the church. With the Church of Philadelphia ending, but it continues if you stay with your King James 1611 Bible and you believe it and you trust in it and you walk in it. This is so important. The Philadelphia Church was so precious in God's sight that he blessed it and he gave it an open door and for hundreds of years, Countries were opening their doors to missionaries because they wanted some of the blessings that these other countries were experiencing from allowing the gospel to be preached in their country. Because they kept his words and the word of his patience, God blessed them. Stick with the King James 1611 Bible no matter what. The 19th century came around and Satan was not about to lay down for another 200 years and let the Philadelphia church experience the, the growth and the, and the power that they were experiencing. So he decided, well, I'm going to start an age of isms and traditions that normally Christians wouldn't experience, but we're going to put so much pressure on them, they're going to start doing the traditions. And that's what got the Jews in trouble, traditions. Like fiddler, fiddler on the roof, remember that? Traditions, it should have been the Bible. All the work of the devil is to pervert the minds of the youth. And that's where he starts. When the Church of Pergamos was going on, and all these perversions, the church was so busy defending the, the, the faith that they weren't preaching to, to, the, to the people. And now that age of Pergamos is perfected in the Laodicea church age. Most Americans aren't aware that Christmas and Easter was banned by 
the Philadelphia church age as being pagan. And even Boston was bold enough to go 1659 to 1681, it was completely outlawed. They were trying to fight the Catholic influence coming into America and to distorting Amer uh, their religion because that's how the devil does it. He gets a foot in the door and he starts to making you compromise. And our God is not a God of compromise. I'm sorry. He will not compromise for nothing. It's this word. And you know this is the seventh English Bible. This is the seventh one to be translated in English. And the Bible talks about uh, purified in the fire seven times. God points everything to this King James Bible. So in the 1800s, we start seeing how Satan was bringing, or the 1900s, they start seeing how Satan was bringing America and the, and the world to a, to a compromised state. In 1836, Alabama was the first state to accept Christmas as a national holiday, or as a state holiday, along with Easter. Originally, Christmas was Saturnalia Day. You know, when you talk about Saturn, you look, I studied art back in the 70s, and, and one thing about the, the, this time period, the Catholics had all the saints with big old halos around their, their heads just like Saturn has a ring around their head. They call it halos, but you know, you look at these pictures painted back then, it was a, a ring around their head, just like your ring around your collar. In 1836, Alabama accepted this, and by 1861, 864,000 soldiers died during the Civil War, one of the worst war, wars we ever had. Hindsight's 2020. After the birth of Christ was set at December 25th, which if you are a Bible student, you know that the Lord was born in September 23. 4004 BC. Just do the math. It's easy. He was 33 and a half years old. He died at Passover. Count back six months. It brings you right to September. In 1870, once the war was over and they started adopting Christmas as a national holiday, Catholicism went from the lowest population of Americans to the highest populations of Americans. And the whole purpose of this country being brought about was to get away from the Catholics. They had 65 anti-Catholic holidays a year. That's how they were afraid of the Catholic Church because of what it did in, in Europe and what it's done around the world. So Joseph Smith in 1820 brought Mormonism in. Here we go with the apostasy, bringing, uh, listening to angels. Alexander Campbell in 1820 brought the Church of Christ. Darwin in 1839, the theory of evolutions, all this stuff happened at the same time within 100 years. That should tell you something. Ellen G. White in 1863, the Seventh-day Adventist, Charles Russell in 1870, Jehovah Witnesses, Mary Baker Eddy in 1875, Christian Science. New religions were popping up everywhere, and all of them were saying, we have taken the place of the Jews. 
throwing most of your Bible out the door. Madame Blavansky, and pastors taught a lot about her. She was a Ukrainian mystic who believed Satan was a good guy and should be worshipped. She was the author and co-founder of the Sifof, Sif, I can't say it. Sif, thank you very much. In 1875, her members of her club were famous, like Sigmund Freud, Westcott and Hoyt, who translated the New Bibles. They worshipped Lucifer. Sigmund Freud was an anti-Semitic, and he taught that the id and the ego of man was why he was like he was. And it wasn't that he was a sinner. He was just a product of his environment. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? In 1885, the attack on the King James Bible by Westcott and Hoyt, two, I believe they were Jesuits, because they loved Mary as a god. They thought the Pope should be running the world and America should be done away with. And people are reading their Bibles today and thinking they're good Americans. They made 36,000 uh, changes in your King James Bible, of which 31,000 can't be found in any manuscript. They just took liberties to change, take out verses, add verses, add words. They had no fear of God. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 18, God warns anyone who changes or take, takes away or adds to his book. Once these new Bibles were being sold, then the publishers got involved in it and said, we want our own Bible to publish and sell, and you know, because the Bible's a bestseller. None of them have ever outsold the King James Bible, but... When you go into a store, you gotta look, you gotta ask for a King James Bible, you just don't find it. But now we got 350 versions. Pick, take your pick, what what denomination you want to pick, you know, and it'll have the right wording. The year 1900s began the end of the greatest and most powerful period in our history. and the church's history. However, as long as someone is preaching from the King James Bible and believes the word and puts their trust in it and relies on this book and doesn't change anything, you're still in the Philadelphia church age. But we're hanging by a thread. God is not a God of compromise. He doesn't care what you think. He put it in his word, and he holds his word higher than his own name. And you can't change it. You can't go anywhere but this book. What we are witnessing right now is all the chickens are coming home to roost, as they say. They have destroyed the nuclear family, and, they have, and they've taken God out of everything in our society, including most churches. I heard this term, and I thought it pretty good. This baby mama culture has created the chaos and mayhem that we're seeing in all of our cities and our country today. America is forcing the world towards a new world order of wokeism and all this other stuff, and most countries are rejecting it. America has lost their influence in this world because we're so wicked. America is under attack by the new world order to take away everything that is great in America, and 
they pretty much have done it. The 19th century, Satan attacks the word of God and doctrines and true science is non-existence anymore. Once the Bible's foundation is gone, the true church is right back where it was in Pergamos. They don't know which way to go or what to believe. They're defending their faith rather than preaching. The 20th, 20th century, Satan attacks morality. If it feels good, do it. I grew up in that generation. And hard work is looked down upon. If you're a hard worker and you're out there working your tail end off and you're sweating every day, the world looks down on that. Now it's welfare and let's go to college so you can get communist indoctrination while you're there. The 21st century, Satan attacks sexuality, confusion of sex, and that's where we're at now. The only thing that matters is what you think you are. Sodomy has disabled America, America's empire. I mean, it's destroyed it. The United Nations is now trying to pass a law to legalize sex with little children globally. Think about it. It should make you mad if you've got little grandchildren. Pushing the immor uh, the, and, and moralizing pedophilia, which is the most disgusting thing that you could possibly think about. And God hates it. God hates it. God says it'd be better if you have a millstone tied on around your neck and thrown into to the sea. Is this low enough for you to convince you that Jesus Christ is about to come back to get his bride? We're about to go home. Get your hearts right with the Lord. Repent of all your sins. And get, you know, the worst thing you can do is stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and you ain't going to be standing. You're, you're going to be flat on your face and try to explain why you did what you did out of ignorance when this is supposed to be the most informed society in the world. We've got these computers. We can go on and find anything if you look for it. I always bring this, this, this verse up because the Bible, when you study the Bible, you have to look for types. You've got to look for them. If you're going to learn anything from the Bible, you've got to look for the types. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, it says, Now all these things happened during the Exodus unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. This is for us. So pay attention. Go back and read Exodus. And look at how things progress. That's exactly the way they're progressing now. Seven years ago, we experienced one of the big expansion of wealth in this country. We had everything. It was going great. And then, and then there was a change. There's a change coming. And everyone's warning everyone, there's going to be food shortages. There's going to be water shortages. There's going to be electricity shortages. There's going to be every kind of shortages you can think about. And a lot of people are going to die. Pestilence. When Joseph went into the land of Egypt, the Pharaoh told him, said, I had a dream. Joseph told him what his dream was, seven good years and seven evil years, bad years. We're about to go into the seven bad years. The rapture of the church is about to happen. Turn to Revelation chapter 4.
My dear and Father, Lord, I pray, give me strength, Lord, and help me to get through this and help open up eyes, Lord, for us in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, Spare not the old world, but save Noah and eight persons, a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood upon a world of the ungodly. We're living in the world of ungodly. But we're not in, we're not the ungodly. We are hid in Christ. Every day you should thank the Lord Jesus Christ over and over and over again. Just like when you tell your wife, you love, I love you, honey. I love you, honey. I love you, honey. Over and over again, you should tell the Lord Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord. Thank you, I love you. Help me to love you more. When Moses was on Mount Sinai, you don't have to turn here, I'll just read it to you. Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, he was up there for 40 days. Just 40 days. The people gathered themselves together and to Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us a God, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. Forty days their faith was gone. They were murmuring. They were displeased with Moses being gone. They were worshiping Moses. As soon as you start murmuring and, and you start doubting that Jesus Christ is going to come back, the devil is there to replace your God with a golden calf. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the Father fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they were willingly ignorant. Is that today? Everybody said, well, they, we're not going to have a rapture. We're going to have to go through the tribulation. And we're going to have to suffer. We're going to have to do this. That's not what my Bible says. Church has been suffering for 2,000 years. And here we're in a Laodicea, a watered-down version of what they had, if you want to know the truth. When a man has no faith, he puts his faith in things. You hear about preppers and people that are saying, you know, trust in, uh, go get you uh, seven years' worth of food. You know how long that's going to last? The first time someone gets hungry, they're coming after you. Shelters. I'm amazed how many people are going underground. How many shelters have been built underground? How many governments have built underground structures just to escape what's coming? Because believe it or not, our government knows that Jesus Christ is going to return. And they're determined to fight him because they're all, most of them are Satanist. Not all of them, but most of them. And the Bible says they'll cry out for the rocks to fall on them to hide them from what's coming. Boy, I would too. But Jesus Christ is still in the saving business. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this. After what? After the church age. But the church age, in a, in a physical, bright sense, has stopped, but it continues on. We'll see that in here in a minute. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. 
And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me and saying, Come up hither, and I will show thee things that must be hereafter. Man, is that going to be a great day. And immediately I was in the spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne. When you look at this, you have to admit that after this, Whenever you see that in the Bible, it's starting something new. After I'm gone, it can go. When you look at John, you say, well, this is only talking to John. But if you do an in-depth study of John, you'll find that John is a picture of the church. Every time you find John, he's on the right side of Jesus with his head on his breast. Anytime the disciples want to know something, they go to John and say, John, what do you think? Can you ask him for us? Because the Bible specifically says he loved the disciples, but he loved John. John is a picture of the church. He's always been a picture of the church. God chose him because John loved the Lord Jesus Christ. John knew who Jesus was. There was no doubt in his mind who Jesus was, just like there should be no doubt in your mind who Jesus Christ is. Amen. So John is a picture of the church. He wrote things like, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And John chapter 19, verse 26 when Jesus therefore saw his mother, he, Jesus is on the cross, he saw his mother and he said, and the disciple standing by whom he loved, John, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. And this is the greatest passage for America in the world. I mean, this is, what, this is why America is blessed. Because John is a type of the church, America embraced the King James 1611 Bible, and Mary is a type of the Jews. Jesus is telling the church, take care of this woman, take care of Israel. Provide her a place to stay. Provide for her, and I'll bless you. And America has been blessed more than any nation in the world because of their stance for Israel. But that's moving away. Man learns from history is that man learns absolutely nothing from history. Revelation chapter 4, 3 says, And he that sat was to look upon as a, like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. We'll come back to those three gems. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had in their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightning and thundering and voices that were there, and there were seven lamps of fire burning. Remember, God threatened to put out those lamps if you didn't repent and overcome. They're still burning. The gospel of the kingdom of heaven is now being preached on earth during the time that we're in heaven. They're not out. They're still going on. Which is the seven spirits of God. When you look at verse 3, John is in the third heaven. He's describing the throne. And these three jewels stand out. The jasper stone, the sardine stone, and the emerald stone. Three beautiful stones, part of the foundation of, of the walls in heaven. Or the new Jerusalem. The jasper stone, if you look at the breastplate of, that 
the high priest wore, he had a breastplate with 12 stones on him. And if you ever want to do a, a wild study, study those stones. But that one jasper stone represents Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Son of my right hand. The sardine stone represents the tribe of Reuben, which means behold a son. And then you have the emerald stone, which re represents Judah, which means praise. Behold the son of my right hand. Behold a son. And if we ever get into the study of stars, that will mean a lot more when you see what, how this thing's, how the cosmos is arranged. And it'll, it, it, it blows my mind. I'm sitting there reading this going, Phew. how can anyone not doubt that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords? Behold a, the son of my right hand. Behold a son. Praise him. That's what that means. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about the pastor. It's not about Billy Graham. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. These 20 elders are sitting around the throne and, and they have white robes and they got crowns on their heads and, and people are going, I wonder who they are. Just read the Bible. It'll tell you. I mean, it's pretty simple stuff. Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 says, and he says, for thou hast, that's, for thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Wow. Those 12 or 24 elders are us. Some of us. I'm sure there's people that are going to be held in high esteem for what they did for the Lord Jesus Christ. They got a crown on their heads. And then they take those crowns and they cast them at his feet. Man, I hope I have a crown. I hope I have 20 of them so I can put them at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, every time you meet somebody, somebody comes to your house, give them the gospel. You never know who you're affecting. But when you look at this stuff and you start look, looking at the first time John is in the presence of God, you get a sense that this is going into the Bema seat, that we're being judged. Because we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And let me tell you something. There's, there's people in here that never make a peep that are probably going to be blessed because of their prayer life and no one even knows they're doing it. You got Rose down here. I'd love to be in her shoes. If I was her, I'd be excited every day every time I heard a trumpet blow. <laughs> because that's one precious lady. But we're all precious in the, in the sight of God. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is going to have his arms open even during the tribulational period. And many of those souls that you've been witnessing to for years are going to get saved during that time. And the 144,000 will be out there preaching. So that gives them a better chance. Can you imagine 144,000 Pauls out there? And the kingdom, you know, we, we worry about preaching to every nation and stuff. But Matthew chapter 24 makes it pretty clear that it's going to be during the tribulational period when this gospel is being preached out. 
And it says in verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. This is during the tribulation. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6 says, And be behold, before the throne there was a sea of glass unto crystal, like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around about the four and four beasts, full of eyes before and behind. I've done study after study on these, these cherubims, these beasts, these four beasts around the throne of God. And they are fascinating. And the first beast is like a lion, and the second beast is like a calf, and the third beast is like the face of a man, and the fourth beast is like a flying eagle. Now, I, I like to sculpt, and my favorite characters are the eagle. I do some bears, and I've done lions, and I've done um, faces of people that, you know, it's hard to make something pretty out of a face. <laughs> but an ox. The lion represents the lion of Judah. That's a, character, a characteristic of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The second beast is like a calf. That's the humble servant. It's like an ox in Ezekiel. And he was humble enough to go to the cross. And he wasn't just a man. He was the God-man. He was the almighty God. And he was, he went to the cross for us. He shed his precious blood on the cross of Calvary for us. That blood has to be applied to you in order for you to go to heaven. And when you receive Jesus Christ, first you believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for me and for you, shed every drop of blood that was in his body for you and for me, went into the heart of the earth and set the captives free. We'll get into that here in just a second if we've got time. But set the captives free and when he set the captives free, they rose with him when he rose. They could only go as far as the blood. And Jesus Christ, when he rose on the third day, he, ascent, he ascended into heaven and applied the blood. And when he came back to earth, he wandered on this earth for 40 days preaching and teaching, and people saw him, and these risen saints, Old Testament saints, wandered through the earth with, with him. And when he ascended, they ascended. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because Paul, when he went up to the third heaven, he went, he talks about paradise. Paradise was in the heart of the earth, Abraham's bosom. And you read about it by the rich man and Lazarus. And when they were down there, uh, when he was in hell, hell was right next to him. But hell doesn't, is not there any, or paradise is not there anymore because when they ascended, when he ascended, they ascended. And they're up there waiting for us. And some of them will have to come back down here and go through this tribulational period. That's another study. But it's a wonderful study. Well, we're going through our marriage ceremony. The people on this earth are going to have to go through a time. But Jesus Christ was the face of the, the face of the man represents the perfected man. The man that, that God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The fourth beast is an eagle, high, uh, flying eagle. And there's nothing more beautiful than an eagle. I got two... I got two hawks, they're not eagles, that live in my yard. And one of them's got this humongous wingspan. And I love to watch them. And they, they're always together. And one's a man and one's a woman. 
I haven't heard any pronouns or anything like that. So I know that's a fact. And they love each other. And everywhere they go, one goes, the other goes. And they're flying and they're magnificent. An eagle is even greater than that. When you see an eagle flying and that wingspan out, and he's just soaring up there in the height, they can go up to 10,000 feet in the air. That's quite a ways. But that's the word, that represents the word of God. High and lifted up. And that's why I lift this Bible up. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things exist because of Him. The Word. Isn't that amazing? I mean, and I haven't even got into the chromosomes and and how all that fits together with the Bible and stuff, that, that's amazing to me. Verse 6, we're seeing the sea of glass. And I think the Lord gave us a sea of glass because when we get into heaven and we're laying flat on our face before the throne of God and we're looking down, we're going to be examining ourselves. We're going to see that mirror and we're going to see our reflection. And we're going to see what, what we are. But at the same time, we're going to think, you know, I don't deserve any of this. I, I, what am I doing here? Here's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is the Almighty God. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I'm seeing a reflection that I don't recognize. Because the flesh is gone. We got a new body. A glorified body. And when you look at this stuff, you go, I'm going to be made of gold? Am I going to be transparent gold like, like the streets? And, but I'm going to look, I'm going to be conformed to his image. What a privilege. So all that was done for me so that I can be like him Shouldn't we be acting like him right now? You know, I can't watch a movie. I just can't. When I know what's going on behind the scenes of these movies, I can't watch them. I can't listen to rock and roll music. I can't listen to country. I can't listen to no, no music. It's all flesh. And when you, you watch these TV shows with preaching and stuff and you see these people, you know, putting on a show for you, I go, that's not of God. Brother Insert got up here and sang the other day, or last week. He sang a beautiful song. And he told you right before, he said, I don't know if I can make it through this song. That is the way God wants all of us. We shouldn't be able to make it through a good Christian Bible-believing song without weeping without tears coming in our eyes because it's not about us. It's not about this building. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is going to be about him. Everything. And I stress that a lot, I know. But the, the older I get, the more I realize that we are absolutely nothing and we're pitiful. I mean, we, we do things that we say, well, we're, we're a good Christian fundamental church and stuff, you know, and then we do some stuff that Philadelphia Church would never put up with. That's why I say examine your hearts. Examine your life. Find out where your priorities are and get rid of them and put them on Jesus. I can't get into too much, but I will go this. I read the other day where Hubble telescope, or this new telescope that they sent up in space, and they said, we can see the Big Bang finally because this thing is so powerful. It goes way out into space, and it's just it's infrared, and we'll see things that, that they never saw before, and we'll prove the Big Bang once and for all. What did they find? 
they find a mature, fully developed universe as far as you go. Exactly what the Bible said. But they said something really interesting. They said that our cosmos is shaped like a pyramid or a tree. And I, I said, that's what the Bible says. It's shaped like this. And it's, it's amazing how much money is spent on trying to prove God wrong and all God does is laugh. <laughs> Excuse me. But these four, and tr these, these four beasts are full of eyes within and, the, and they rest not day or night, verse 8, saying, holy, holy, holy. And when these, those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, and the four and twenty elders fall down before him. <coughs> Excuse me. And cast their crowns before him, before the throne, saying, now this is wonderful. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Don't ever get the idea that you're special. You're not special. None of us are special. He's special. He gets all the glory. He gets all the honor. It's all about him. And here are these, peop these four cherubims, night and day, day and night, praising the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says God is a spirit and they that Worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. In order to have worship, and I hear about worship services, and I, I, I talked to, had friends I worked with, and they, they told me, oh, I wrote this song for the worship service, and I did this for the worship service, and I did. And I said, uh, I'm, I hate to tell you this, but that's not worship. The Bible says, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This book. At home, at work, around the world, wherever you go, you should be able to worship the Lord. And I've said this before, we practice here on earth we, work, we practice worship on earth. But when we get to heaven, it's going to be perfected. Because we will be perfected. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord we love you. We're not worthy of you, Lord. We're not worthy of the blood. We're not worthy of the cross. We're not worthy of anything. But, Lord, you, you came to us, Lord. You offered your salvation by believing and trusting in that gift that you gave us on the cross, your blood, your sacrifice, your stripes. And we thank you, Lord. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for being our Savior. Lord, I pray that you'll bless the message that's going to be preached today by Pastor Lawson, and I pray that, Lord, that you'll bless everyone here, and Lord, I pray that if the power of the Holy Spirit comes on someone today, Lord, I pray that they make, they don't leave this house without receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, because we don't know what, what happens after we leave this house today. Help us to prepare our hearts and our minds and our thoughts 
to be towards you. And when we stand before you, Lord, I pray that everyone here will be right with thee for asking the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm. Oh, by the way, if I didn't get to go through half my notes. If you want my notes, um, give me your email address and I'll send them to you.